uh, lovely evening to everyone if you're present here. Today we will be speaking about a few technical uh, terms, a few technical terms that have been, few technical terms and technical issues that you might have been facing and the reasons behind them, I'll explain them as quick as I can possibly can. So uh, uh, the topics for today's classes will be, one, what is anti-aliasing? Two, why is shutting down your PC important? Three, the differences between hard disk drive and solid state drives. Four, uh, uh, what are like the what are moderately safe temperatures for your computer or your laptops? And uh, why is CAPTCHA needed? And why are many websites using CAPTCHA? And what is DPI or CPI? They, them being counts or dots per inch. So uh, let's start our class uh, with what is anti-aliasing. Uh, as you like, you guys might have heard anti-aliasing in a lot of places, mostly in games and also in your MS Word files. So anti-aliasing is the act of uh, is the act of keeping two frames, two frames. Let's say this is one image. In this one image, uh, let's say because uh, as you already know, uh, in the computer all the lines they are made out of dots square cubic dots so uh, so these can cause like they don't look when you enlarge them when you enlarge the picture so what you'll see is a cube here a cube here for a simple line but when it goes like when when the pixels are small then it'll look like a small line so uh, what anti-aliasing does is uh, it it takes two pictures similar to each other the one where it's uh, let's say straight and the other one which is a little bit bent because you know in something where constant movement is present then uh, the picture can the lines cannot be linear so in these kind of cases what anti-aliasing does is it takes those two pictures and then it blurs them together it blends them together so what happens is you get a blurred line so that blurred line is what anti-aliasing is what anti-aliasing is the stronger the anti-aliasing the stronger the blur is, meaning like the more uh, profound and clear line you see, even though two or more frames have been used. So this is what anti-aliasing does. It allows your com it like allows the text in your computer to look more cleaner, but it will uh, certainly lag and also uh, hamper in your refresh rate of your computer. No, I have not ever heard of this AA thing. I don't even need AA. But seriously, guys, I'm not talking about Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm talking about anti-aliasing, which refers to the technology that removes jaggies or the staircase effect from your video games in real time, making them appear smoother. So where the heck do jaggies come from? Well, the images on your computer screen are made up of tiny squares called pixels, whereas real objects have rounded corners. So what happens is when you take a bunch of squares and line them up, you end up with a nice straight line that looks perfect. But then what happens if you try to draw a diagonal line? That's where the squares end up corner to corner and you end up with that staircase effect that looks quite unappealing. Now there are a wide variety of different kinds of anti-aliasing, the most basic being MSAA or multi-sample anti-aliasing and some more advanced newer ones like FXAA, which is a faster, more approximate style of anti-aliasing from NVIDIA, but they all work in fundamentally the same way. That is to say that they take the missing data in that line and they go, okay, well, there's, there's a gap here, but we're gonna take samples all around it and try to fill in the approximate data that should be there in order to make the image look more pleasing to the user. I call anti-aliasing fake resolution. You're always better off to increase the resolution to get a more clear image, hence something like Apple's Retina display, where rather than using anti-aliasing tricks, they actually are just squeezing more pixels into the point where your eye can't even tell that it's a square block anymore. But if you don't have that option, anti-aliasing is a way of making it look smoother and higher resolution without actually upgrading the display device that you're using. Thank you for checking out this explanation on TechWiki for anti-aliasing. And as always, don't forget to share the video, don't forget to like the video, and don't forget to subscribe for more fast as possible topics just like this one. So now moving on to second topics, why is shutting down our PC important? Well, as you already know, our PC already does a lot of work in our day-to-day -day lives. And let's say I was making a PowerPoint presentation for my tomorrow's class, then I'll be having to prepare a PowerPoint presentation and let's say uh, oddly like let's say oddly out of nowhere there is like literally no electricity and the lines cut off 
then we can also call it as uh, like the line is currently off. So we didn't shut it down, but my computer went off. So what happens is the data that was uh, the data that was being processed at that time it could get corrupted, and as it gets corrupted, I could no longer use it. Uh, in a lot of uh, newer in a lot of newer applications such as MS Word and Photoshop, so what it happens is they do a thing known as auto saving. Auto saving is literally they save the program that you are doing. They save anything you are doing. Saves the progress in like a certain interval of time. Like you can set it on your own by going towards its uh, settings. Uh, a lot of them are around five minutes to a minute. So, uh, but let's say you are not using one of these uh, applications that are them. And let's say you are using an application that doesn't, that doesn't actually have any of these auto saving files then what will uh, happen is you will have lost all of your data, you will have lost all of your progress and all of your hard work will have like resulted to nothing. So uh, so that is one reason why you should shut down your PC. And the other reason is uh, the like, you might be really tempted because like the, let's say the Windows update takes a lot of time and you might be irritated by looking at it for like around one hour because it genuinely takes a lot of time for Windows to update. And then you might be frustrated at the fact that it's not quick. And then uh, you might be frustrated at the fact that you wanted to sleep, but because like the computer is on, uh, you cannot sleep properly. Uh, so, uh, so the reason, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to reason you why uh, you should not like forcefully shut your computer down during Windows uh, update. So what's happening in Windows update is your Windows is actually going through your system files. It is updating your system files. Let's say there was a small bug in the system file, which didn't allow some form of applications to work, like some form of application that uses a specific amount of code. So it doesn't work. So what system actually file does is it actually, it actually allows, it actually allows like the computer to get like the new data, the new BIOS, and then it gets imprinted on like the old one and the old one gets removed completely first. And then only you will get your new one. So what is happening is, so if you uh, like, if you out of nowhere pull it off, so you might actually brick your computer. Bricking your computer means making it absolutely obsolete. So a lot of times, what happens is uh, people brick their computers because of these Windows uh, like updates. So let's say like they were updating their Windows, but it took a lot of time. They got frustrated, and they let's say they switched their power off, or they pull the plug off. So what will happen actually is your your computer as I just said, as it is probably cutting off the old data, the old system data and keeping a new one, uh, it might be that you might have just like, you, have, you might have just absolutely timed it so perfectly that you have, that all the system files have been deleted, but none have been actually kept. Or like, let's say half of them have been kept and half of them is not. So what happens in these kind of cases is your computer won't function properly because it doesn't have the system files that is required for applications to use, for your computer itself to use and to boot itself. So this is the reason why you should not shut your PC down. This is the reason why you should shut your PC down and not pull the plug itself. And then we can move on towards the third topic. The third topic being the difference between hard disk drive and solid state drive. Uh, hard disk drives are mechanical drives while solid state drives are, they are a uh, small, smaller in shape, a lot compact, and the uh, firstly, the main difference is hard disk drive take around, uh, let's say a small book size, a small book, uh, yeah, around like a palm size. A palm size is the size of a hard disk drive. While SSDs can come in various forms, uh, there are two major forms. Uh, uh, two major forms have been named like on their basis through which they actually transfer data, one being SATA SSD and one being NVMe SSD. So uh, the difference between SATA and NVMe SSD is SATA SSDs are uh, just like hard disk drives. They are rectangular in shape, uh, but they are really compact. Like it's like you can stack three uh, solid state drives to uh, like amount for the thickness of a hard disk drive. And solid state drives are also a lot uh, like smaller in the form factor as well. And so what these SATA of like SSD do is they use the SATA link, the SATA is SATA is literally uh, a connection, is a wire through which data is transferred from your motherboard to your uh, storage. 
so it's uh, literally what it's doing is it's uh, like a link from cpu till your uh, storage device so the setup is that and then there is nvme ssd nvme ssd can be so compact that it can be like literally half of your small ruler size uh, it can be like two centimeters uh, in length while in breadth while it's around six to five centimeters in breadth so as you already can figure it out it's really short and it's really small and these are really compact and they're very fast as well uh, ssds are genuinely around 10 to 15 times faster than hard disk drive the main reason being uh, hard disk drives don't have dram dram or dedicated uh, random access memory what it does is it allows so in the newer ssd what's happening is uh, a lot of a little amount of DRAM is kept, around 512 kilobytes of DRAM is kept in an SSD. So what it does is it, it allows the DRAM, it allows the SSD to actually keep in touch with all the data that is actually inside the solid state drive itself because solid state drives, uh, the storage is in ROM, ROM format while the RAM is it's constantly refreshing while the ROM is uh, it's stationary in like motion. It's, it's, in the motion it is in stationary so what's happening is the dram the dram actually allows the data to be completely con constantly refreshed and the positions won't change because uh, that's how ssd works so it's very easy for like the computer to know where the data is and from where the data needs to be taken out of so that's the reason why ssds are around like 10 to 15 times faster than your hard disk drives and then there comes uh, your hard disk drives. Your hard disk drives are mechanical drives, meaning they have to function in mechanical activities, mechanical activities such as spinning. So what's happening in hard disk drives? There's a uh, there's a disk, as it's probably known as the name, such a hard disk drive. There's a disk, and then there's a laser pointer. So what's happening is the disk moves, the disk spins uh, at rates. There are two types of uh, right now in constant uh, like environment there is two types of uh, hard disk drive in two different speeds these two different speeds are one is 5400 rpm while the other is 7200 rpm what is rpm it's uh reads for like reads per minute meaning it spins that many times it spins like 7200 times per minute that's genuinely fast but it might seem fast but it's really slow because the lead because what's happening is that the disk is constantly moving but the laser pointer can only point at a certain point so the laser will have to go all around like looking for the data and the data can be like so let's say this is a disk so let's say this is a disk and uh, this marker that i have is a laser so uh, this laser will be pointed here while this disk will be spinning so let's say your data is actually over here well, this laser pointer could spend a lot of time going through all around here, and then only it can reach here. So this is the reason why uh, hard disk drives are really much slower than SSDs, because SSDs have those DRAMs that already know the location of the data that the data that like the computer is asking. So it can be snappy, while hard disk drive they have to constantly look for it, making them slow. Uh, now let's move on towards another topic, and the topic is thermals or temperatures. Uh, so you might have already known a lot of uh, there's a lot of difference between uh, the temperature of a computer and the temperature of a PC and a temperature of a laptop. Laptop is uh, genuinely in a smaller form factor, meaning it can have less amount of space. It already has less amount of space. Having less amount of space, meaning it has less amount of cooling agent, and having less amount of cooling agent means it's already running at very hot temperatures. But the difference between PC is PC is actually really big in size so that that means there's a lot of space to accommodate for your cooling agents cooling agents such as bulky uh bulky coolers bulky coolers a lot of fans uh, these allow a lot of airflow and allow your system components to be a lot cooler and having your system components a lot of cooler means that their life expectancy increases as well because they are silicons and as you already know silicons they are they don't conduct they don't conduct heat but they conduct electricity so this is what's happening here uh but like the heat can like slowly it can damage the system like the damage the silicon itself so what happens is it slowly becomes obsolete so uh like so to mitigate this uh temperature has to be moderated so but in a lot of laptops due to like the lack of space 
they'll just keep one or two fans or uh, or really small moderator fans that'll allow your computer to reach around 90 degrees celsius but never reach 100 degrees celsius uh, 100 degrees celsius being as your you know the boiling point of water uh, which is very hot so your cpu actually runs pretty hot in your laptops while in a computer uh the like average amount like if you have a, a stock cooler stock cooler meaning the cooler that comes inside the box of the cpu itself or like your gpu itself uh, they should be they should probably be running around at around 50 to 60 degrees in medium load and around 35 degrees in uh, idle and around 70 degrees in heavy load uh, heavy load can be playing games or it can be having tons of chrome tabs any of them so this is uh and as you already know there's a lot of cooling so like the computer has to be a lot cooler than a laptop so a laptop can be around 90 degree and they can run very nicely so you don't have to be afraid of your laptop running around 90 degrees celsius because that's pretty normal for all the laptops but if your computer is reaching around 90 degrees celsius then you have to get it checked because a lot of cooling agencies are acting and uh, it's a lot of acting and like to get that high amount of temperature you have to, like have a really obsolete cooling agent so now we are moving on towards capture so what is capture capture is uh, it is like a way through which like websites nowadays find out if you're a bot or not because uh, while using a computer we don't generally know if you are a bot or not because a lot of activities that you do it's simulated inside the computer itself. You are moving the mouse. Uh, well, the computer simulates the movement of the mouse. So that's what's actually happening. So what a bot does, a bot is uh, literally, it's like a bot is something that is programmed by a human to imitate human activities or to do certain jobs. So a bot can actually, like, let's say, uh, log into our website. So to mitigate this, uh, like to mitigate this, they have started using CAPTCHA. So what CAPTCHA does is it's it's a test for like bots because there are certain things that a bot can't do what a human can. Like a bot can't uh, read off of an image. A bot can't read off of an image. An image that has been caught. Like let's say uh, I have written uh, Pasang, but I have actually, uh, while writing Pasang, I have made a dash in like, like A. So then the computer will think that the A is actually not present because they think that's a corrupted, corrupted character. So they won't include it. So the bot, and this is what like the capture does. It tests the bot and uh, tests the human as well. And uh, because like for humans, those, uh, those tasks are very easy, but for bots, those are Herculean tasks, uh, which are to continue watching this video, prove that you are a human by clicking on every box that contains a Linus. Who are we kidding? We welcome all viewers, organic or robotic, here at TechWiki. But back on topic, odds are you've probably seen little tests like that scattered around the internet when you're trying to post a comment, create an account, or buy something. They're called CAPTCHAs, which stands for Completely Automated Public Turing Tests to Tell Computers and Humans Apart. <laughs> Proving once again that the computer science community continues to struggle with the concept of acronyms. Anyway, the irony of using computing techniques to trick other computers isn't really new. Leet speak, which goes all the way back to the early 1980s, originated as a method of preventing content from being easily searchable and to work around obstacles like profanity filters, a use that is still common to this day. But modern CAPTCHA didn't come around until the late 1990s, when the then popular search engine AltaVista, man I'm old, was trying to find a way to prevent bots or automated computer programs from adding tons of spam and malicious URLs to their link database. They wanted to put some kind of barrier in place and approach the problem by thinking about something that both humans and computers were good at, namely optical character recognition, which you can learn more about here. Then, 
introducing elements that made the task much more difficult for computers while keeping it fairly easy for humans. And since computers of the day could only recognize clear, easy to read text, AltaVista's engineers forced the user, or the bot as it were, to read a puzzle with distorted, misaligned text with stray marks in order to submit a URL to the database. Cool, right? This form of CAPTCHA continues to be quite popular, along with audio CAPTCHA for the visually impaired that in a similar vein typically includes spoken letters that are somewhat garbled to defeat automated sound analysis. Q, Y, Y 2, two six, 6, W. You'll see it employed in situations ranging from preventing bots from signing up for social media accounts to cut down on spam to verification on ticket buying websites to ensure that bots working for ticket scalpers can't snatch up all the tickets to popular events. You might even see CAPTCHAs more frequently if you're using a VPN service as many website administrators are aware that VPNs are a popular tool that scammers can use to conceal their identities. So a request from a known VPN IP address is more likely to trigger a CAPTCHA prompt. But there's a bit more to it than simply presenting the scheming bot with a confusing image. CAPTCHA scripts also need to be written securely so that the correct answer isn't available to the bot through a back door. For example, some CAPTCHA scripts, especially many freely available ones, render the text on the user's computer instead of on the server and handle the answer in plain text, meaning that a bot can be written to steal the answer without ever solving the puzzle. But even if proper security is implemented, bots are also getting a lot more sophisticated than they used to be, and greater processing power has enabled them to use machine learning to get better at solving these kinds of CAPTCHAs. So everything from image recognition puzzles to trivia questions have been employed to stay one step ahead of the spam bot arms race. But Linus, what about those prompts that I've been seeing these days that just say, I'm not a robot, and then I just check a box. I mean, couldn't a robot do that? <laughs> How does that work? Well, this is a pretty cool mechanism from Google called NoCAPTCHA. It actually tracks your mouse movements right before you check the box. Humans tend to move their mice in wiggly, imperfect ways when they want to point at something, whereas this behavior is usually absent with a bot. NoCAPTCHA also looks at your IP address and cookie activity to see if it's probably consistent with a human instead of a bot. And this automation has made it much faster and less frustrating for the user, increasing its popularity. It's generally regarded as reliable, which is cool, but back to that face I made before, it has privacy advocates concerned about how much information it's sending to Google and, uh, how exactly is it being used? <laughs> oh, that Google. <laughs> but considering how many people see an opportunity to make a quick buck by deploying spam bots as the internet's influence continues to grow, it isn't likely we'll see the human verification arms race cool down anytime soon. I just hope that it doesn't reach the point where we have to submit like a DNA sample and like a stool sample just to downvote somebody on Reddit. Are really hard. So uh, this is what this CAPTCHA and this is its importance. Now DPI and CPI, they are like literally the same thing. It just means dots or counts per inch uh, respectively. So these are more prominent in your mouse. Uh, so this is a mouse. It's a pretty pathetic mouse, but it's still a mouse. So there's a dot, there's like a point. I have a point here in my mouse. Uh, it's a button that allows me to change my uh, CPI or DPI. So what is CPI or DPI? Uh, CPI or DPI literally means, as you can like know by the name itself, dots per inch. Meaning like, uh, so if I have a low DPI, so what happens is if I have a low DPI, then like I'll have to move my mouse farther for it to actually uh, like I'll have to move like 
So lower amount of DPI, like lower amount of dots, means lower amount of travel in your uh, computer as well. So uh, let's say my mouse is uh, in the middle of the screen. Let's say I have a very low DPI. Let's say I have a DPI of 250. Then if I move my mouse around one inch, then it'll just move around 250 pixels, which is not a lot. And uh, let's say I have a DPI of 1,400. Then if I, even if I move my mouse one inch, it'll move 1,400 uh, pixels in distance. So as you can see, this is what DPI does. It's like the act, the action you do, the amount you move your mouse is similar, but like the response from the computer is different because that's what DPI does. It makes it so that uh, the the more the DPI, the farther your mouse actually, the, the farther, the farther your pointer travels. And then the lesser the DPI, the lesser it travels. But like, even if it's in constant, like let's say I just move one inch for one inch, the higher the DPI, the more the distance, the lower the DPI, the lower the distance. So that was our class for today. Uh, if you didn't understand anything, you are, feel, you, are, you are free to ask me questions. Any questions? No questions. Okay, so that will conclude our class for today. Um, so uh, today we learned about uh, DPIs. We learned about the difference between hard disk drives and solid state drives. We learned why we should keep our temperatures in check. And we also learned about uh, shutting down and its importance. And we also learned about capture. And we also learned about anti-aliasing. So this was our today's class. Thank you for attending. Go try to shop for a gaming mouse and you'll often have someone try to sell you one based on how many DPI it's rated at. But this is actually one of the most overused, overhyped words in the gaming peripheral industry. But before we get into that, I should probably explain what DPI actually means. DPI is a misnomer when referring to mouse sensitivity. It stands for dots per inch, meaning the number of dots that can fit in a straight line, which is one inch in length on a screen or printed image. The proper name for measurement of mouse sensitivity is actually CPI or counts per inch. This is the number of counts or virtual pixels that the mouse sensor will be able to display and register on a surface in one inch of physical space. Optical sensors have a maximum native resolution or a native CPI based on the size constraints of a mouse, usually somewhere between 800 and 1600 CPI. So in order to raise the CPI beyond that level, manufacturers actually have to split each virtual representation of a pixel into four or more virtual pixels, which is why DPI, technically CPI, measurements given by manufacturers are usually in multiples of 800. Well, split away, you might be saying. Higher CPI must always be better. Eh, let's not go that far. Splitting these virtual pixels actually causes some significant issues with sensor accuracy, as having more virtual pixels creates more noise or interference, and therefore more errors when reading mouse movements. The main message here is that just because your mouse has 8,000 CPI does not mean that it's actually able to read more information than a mouse with 800 CPI. CPI is only a measurement of the relationship between how how far your mouse moves on the surface and how far your cursor moves on the screen, not a measurement of precision or accuracy. So then why do mouse manufacturers insist on releasing these mice with monstrous DPI numbers attached to them? The main reason is, as usual, marketing and branding. Being able to say, oh, we're a brand new mouse now featuring a 10 billion DPI sensor sounds much more impressive than, you know, our new mouse with like, you know, better quality switches inside it or any number of other features features that might actually make a difference. And it's not helped by the fact that the industry created hype around this, then gamers created hype around it thinking it was good and this creates a positive feedback loop around this feature that doesn't actually improve the product necessarily and in some cases even makes it less accurate. The second reason is that there are some people out there who enjoy using their mouse at some ridiculous high sensitivity. Whether they use very high resolution displays, they move their mouse with little micro movements, 
mouse, or they just like to whip the mouse cursor around on the screen faster than most people's eyes can even move. And third, there are some people who legitimately do believe that they are more accurate in shooters and other games while using an extremely high hardware CPI and lowering their sensitivity in software. But as I mentioned before, a higher CPI usually leads to more noise and a higher error rate for mouse movements. So let's just say the jury is still out on that last one. All right, so it's conclusion time. Is there a proper or best DPI? The short answer is no. As is the case with most computer peripherals, it's going to come down to personal preference. So there isn't necessarily a CPI that is better than the rest. The good news is that most mice come with adjustable CPI, so all you need to do is experiment with a few different ones, play around with your software sensitivity and cursor speed, and find out what works for you. What we can say for sure is that for the foreseeable future, we've pretty much reached the top end of what we need in terms of CPI, so it's time for mouse manufacturers to work on features that will actually improve the user experience, something some of them are actually starting to do these days.